Anyone excited for God's word? Yeah. What he's got for us? I love this book. And I love what it does to our lives and our souls when we, when we bring it forth and allow it to just shape who we are as people. And I'm praying today that God's word will go forth. And it will um, impact it, your, you, impact the people, and impact the communities that you are involved in outside of this building as well. How many people know the church isn't a building, but it's the people? It's what we carry. Spirit of God is within us. And where we go, we take that victory of the cross with us. And we can um, shift things in the supernatural that people may, may, around you may not even realize and know about. We've been going through this series called Everyday Faith. Why don't you all say Everyday Faith? Everyday, Everyday Faith is, is looking at what does it mean to live a life full of faith? How do we live an everyday life where we are brimming and full with faith? A question I was once asked um, many years ago, which has helped shape my weeks in many ways, is what, how much faith has it taken you to get through the last week? And that was a real difficult question for me to ask a few years ago, because I thought, actually, it's not taken that much. If I really strip it back and look at it, it's not taken that much faith for me to get through that last week. Some of you, that will be your story this morning, and for some of you, it won't be your story. Some of you will have had really hard weeks, and it will have taken a lot of faith to see God in the middle of difficulties. And I'm hoping today that the Spirit of the Lord and the Word of God can come and encourage you this morning, but also maybe convict some of us this morning. Is that okay? Were you up for being changed by God this morning? Come on. Um, we're going to be turning in a moment to Mark chapter 10. If you've got a Bible, you feel free to turn there. For those that are watching online, it's going to come up on your screen. And for those in the room with us that don't have a Bible with you, that's absolutely fine. I'm going to read it out in just a moment. And uh, we're going to read a story that was one of the first stories I actually ever read when I became a Christian. I'm going to share a bit of my story uh, during this sermon. Um, I became a Christian when I was 15 years old. And um, I was brought up in church, so I knew church quite well. But One of the first stories that really grabbed my heart, really grabbed my soul and my faith, was this story. And I want to introduce you to a man who's called Blind Bartimaeus. And I believe he can teach us a little bit about what faith means in the everyday of our lives this morning. What I love about Blind Bartimaeus, before we read the words, is that he wasn't a spectacular man. His CV wasn't stacked with lots of great things to be a great man of God. He didn't have a degree at Bible college. He didn't have a degree at all. He wasn't a good communicator. He didn't have a great business. He didn't work in a really good job. Financially, he was actually broke. Yet this man shows us that in the kingdom of God, we do not have to be spectacular in order to be significant. That our significance actually reigns somewhere else. It doesn't reign from our gifting and our calling. It reigns from our intimacy and our value in the kingdom of heaven. And I can declare with you this morning that every single one of you here this morning is valued in the kingdom of God. You have a sound and a voice. You have some, something to bring to God. And whatever that is and whatever it looks like, God wants to use it to help his kingdom advance in this earth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's, let's read. Mark chapter 10. We're reading from verse 46. And it's going to come up on the screen. And they came to Jericho... And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. What a great act of faith. Our faith can make Jesus stop. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? Could Jesus be asking you that question this morning? What do you want me to do for you this morning? Where's your faith at? Where's our expectancy at? The blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately, he recovered his sight, and he followed him on the way. Aren't we grateful that Jesus is our great healer, that he comes and restores broken situations, that he picks people up from the dirt, and he brings them into his purpose. And I believe this morning, we'll hopefully see the gospel do the same in some of our lives this morning. Can we pray together for the word of God? Holy Spirit, I ask, Lord, that you come. And you just bring life to these words that we've just read out. We ask, Holy Spirit, that the very words we read off the pages will come and they'll shape our hearts. They'll mold us as a family and as a community. They'll make a difference in our everyday life. And as we explore what it means to live a life full of faith every day, 
we ask Jesus, who is our great ambassador, you are a great role model. Will you teach us this morning? Will you teach us this morning? So God, anything that I say that is not of you and it's not of your will this morning, I pray, God, that it falls away and it dissipates. But anything that is of you, God, anything you want to speak to your people, we as a family, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you use it to change us and help us and shape us. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. 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 How many of you all know that we're living in a generation currently and the culture of our generation is a culture of communication? Yeah? Anyone got social media in the room? Yeah? So we're living in a generation full of communication. Communication is a big aspect of what we do. We are living in a world of text, emails, tweets, statuses, Instagrams, pictures, boomerangs, you name it, we've got it. We're living in a world of communication. But one of the things I've realized in my generation now is we have a surplus of opinions but a lack of wisdom. We have a lot of thoughts but not so much time to address whether they're right or not. Social media has amplified this a lot in our lives. We have lots of people that will have strong opinions on certain subjects which are right or left, right or wrong. You decide. We have lots of people with lots of opinions but not so much wisdom. I've realized that one of the hidden functions of a good communicator is not the art to speak, but it's the art to listen. I think we have lost the art to listen at times. My generation has certainly lost the art to listen at times. We're too busy trying to get our words out instead of taking in what people may be saying. How many people know it's important what you listen to? What you hear is super, super important. And what I love about Blind Bartimaeus within this story is he teaches us some things about listening. And we're going to get there in just a moment. But one of the things I just want to bring forth first before we start is from Revelation 3 verse 6. And it's going to come up on the screen behind me. Revelation 3 verse 6. It says, These words, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. What I love about this passage, which is going to start off one of the aspects that I want to bring of what I believe it means to live a life right now of everyday faith, is it speaks about hearing. But here's what the passage doesn't say. It doesn't say, he who is a pastor of a church. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. It doesn't say, he who is a prophet. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. It doesn't say he who is a preacher, he who has a business. It doesn't say any of that. It says he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So those with ears with us this morning, I'm going to ask you this question. What do you hear this morning? What do you hear? What is the Spirit of God saying to you in your everyday life right now? Think about it. How often and how frequent are you hearing this active and alive God come and speak into your soul about past, present, or future situations? What do you hear? I believe the Spirit of the Lord wants to bring forth a hearing church once again. I believe if we are to move into the plans and purposes of God, we must first hear what He is saying in order to obey what He is asking us to do. Amen? Amen. And here we have a question. Blind Bartimaeus is in this situation. He's been hearing these murmurs of Jesus for about a couple of years in this moment. Jesus is spread across the land. His fame is growing. He's a very famous person. Some people hate him. Some people love him. And at the very entrance of Jericho, which is the entrance and gateway in and out of this great city, here we have blind Bartimaeus. And on this one particular day, a different day to all the other days, he hears the footsteps of people. And he hears the murmurs of a crowd, just like that excitement and that energy you get when you're walking into some form of stadium or a gig or a show. People are murmuring and speaking about it, and he hears these words, Jesus. And he clicks on. The famous man, this this prophet, this preacher, this teacher, this person that's going around and doing great things across our region, he's here right now. So he shouts out, Jesus! Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Listen to these words in verse 48 that come back. It says, many around him rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Many around him, those who are following Jesus, those who are seeing him do great things, they rebuke this man and they tell him to be silent. 
one thing we can learn from this is the friendships around you will literally accelerate you or they will stagnate you. We have to have good friends in our lives. The voices that surround our lives are super important to your development in the spiritual realms. Who you have speaking into your soul and speaking into your situation is incredibly important to your development as a person. We live in a world of constant communication, constant words, constant things trying to grab our attention. We've, apparently there's over 1,000 adverts you will see per day. You are always living in a world that something is trying to grab your attention. In a world that is so toxic with its noise, how do we ensure we are hearing the right voices? Church, what do you hear this morning? Blind Bartimaeus in this story had a choice. He could hear the words of the people that rejected him. And sometimes we live too long out of the words of rejection, friends. Sometimes rejection from the past is still holding us back and it happened 20 years ago. Sometimes words from way back then are still making a difference in our lives. Now, how many people know sometimes it's hard to get past certain words that have been spoken over your lives? And here we have blind Bartimaeus, and what he is faced with at this moment is the voice, and he is hearing the sounds of rejection, the sounds of greed, the sounds of superiority, the sounds of frustration, the sounds of you're not worthy, stop speaking to the king and the rabbi. The sounds of, you are not important enough. And here we have blind Bartimaeus listening to the sounds that were not designed for his life. They were designed for his downfall. How many of us are still living under the lies of the enemy? Words that say to you, you're not worthy. You don't have a voice. You are rejected. You don't have the skill set. You're not gifted enough. Your family line is too broken. Your relationships, you messed up in that. And here we have blind Bartimaeus looking at this whole area of words, the voice he is listening to. But what I love about this story is blind Bartimaeus chooses to listen to the superior voice of the kingdom of God. Colossians 3.2 says that we should have eyes that are far above our circumstances. We should see things in a way higher way than the world see things. So when we face rejection, God's word still stands strong and true over our lives. Amen? Amen. This is the following of everyday faith. And in everyday faith, we need to choose to listen to the word of God rather than the word of the world. So in the political climate we find ourselves in, with chaos up in the air in this nation, what do we listen to? The rights and wrongs, the do's and don'ts, or the word of God? Which always beckons out the same truth, that his plans will come to fruition. He is far greater and superior to our current situations and circumstances. Blind Bartimaeus is there. And he listens to these words in the face of disappointment, in the face of rejection. He realized what was packaged as disappointment came out to be God-given opportunity. And he wasn't going to allow the blockings of a miracle to stop him from encountering Jesus. Romans 10 verse 17 says these words. So faith comes from hearing. Faith comes from hearing. That is hearing the good news about Jesus Christ. Anyone remember the good news of Jesus Christ? Anyone thankful they encountered the good news of Jesus Christ? That it came and transformed our lives and I'm nearly dying there. <laughs> <laughs> the good news of Jesus Christ. One of the things I've realized in, in marriage, I've been married now for four months. You can round of applause for that if you want, I don't mind. <laughs> going strong, going well. One of the things I love about uh, being married with Em, and, and Em, who's my wife, who's on the front row, she's a phenomenal woman, and I'm not just saying that so I get lucky later. <laughs> I'm on about dinner, obviously. Um, she is genuinely phenomenal. I said that in the first service, and she went just as red as she's going now. I've waited 26 years to say that joke, I tell you now, so I'm allowed to say it. Um, what I've learned about uh, marriage and what I've learned about the journey of marriage, even in the short space of time I have been involved in that, is that marriage takes a lot of faith. 
Marriage takes faith in the other person. It takes faith in our circumstances. It takes faith into our future. It takes faith that the past won't define who we are as a couple. Marriage takes a lot of faith. And I just want to pause a moment. I did this in the first service, and I think it's important to do it again in this service. Could I just have a show of hands for those that have been married for over 20 years? Wow. Just before, I don't, I don't want to move on from that moment because that was a bit of a pity applause there. Um, guys, could you stand up for a moment if that's okay? Just take a look around for a moment, these guys. I know this is just a random number. Some of you will be married 19, 18 years, and you are so involved in this so far as well. One of the things that I've learned about being married in four months is that marriage is one of the greatest and truest messages of the gospel. It beckons out in a, word of, in a world of unfaithfulness to be faithful to a partner for a long time is a beautiful and glorious thing in the eyes of God. And I just want to take a moment for you guys to say thank you on our behalf for being great carriers of the gospel in your marriage, for being faithful to your partner, and for continuing to see what God has got for you in the past, present, and future. He believes in you, and we as a church are so thankful for you showing us what faithful is in the gospel. <laughs> you take a seat. Faithfulness is important. So we understand that listening is important. The message version in that same verse, it says the faith comes from hearing. The message version says this, this is the point. Before you trust, you must listen. Before you take that step of faith, you must listen. Before you change your job, you must listen. Before you take a step of faith on behalf of your family, you must listen. Because before you can really trust in the plans and purposes of God, you first must hear what he is saying. What you're hearing is so important. The question remains from this scripture, blind Bartimaeus was hearing a whole range of things in this story. He's hearing the murmurs of Jesus and he's excited by that, but he's also hearing these voices of many people around him that are rejecting him, saying he's not worthy, saying, be quiet, be quiet. He doesn't want to know about you. You're just a homeless person that has no part to play in this story. Be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. So the question remains simply this, how do we respond to the voices that are not God's voices in our life? How do we respond to situations that are not healthy and not good? They are not from God. They are from the world or they are from the sin or they are from the enemy. How do we respond to these voices of negativity? I believe Blatterbine Bartimaeus is going to show us a little bit. If you turn with me to verse 48 again, it says these words. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. What a sound that is. A sound that can make Jesus stop in his tracks. What a beautiful, glorious worship that looks like. That when we worship and make sound to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, above our difficulties, it can make Jesus stop. Oh, how I pray for a church and a sound that comes from it that makes Jesus stop. How I pray for a region in Devon that will make a sound that's going to make Jesus stop. How I pray for your workplaces that a sound can come forth that's going to make Jesus stop. Yeah. Our sounds are important. What we hear is important, but also our sound is important. Yeah. Do you know there's a sound in your life? There's a sound in your life that may have been blocked, distransferred away, blocked out, rejected, that is designed to come out on behalf of the kingdom. And I'm not just speaking of a song here, because I can't sing. I'm speaking of a sound of a life that penetrates workplaces, that laughs in the face of evil and darkness, that moves forth in a way that nothing else can move forth because Jesus responds to your sound. What a beautiful story this is, that we have a king and a God who listens to your every thought and your every word. He literally listens to your sounds when you're by yourself, when things are going bad, when it's difficult. Jesus is the God that listens to you, but doesn't just listen, he responds. 
What is your sound? I believe we have a sound for every situation. We have a sound for hurt. We have a sound for rejection. We have a sound for difficulty, a sound for sickness, a sound for whatever gi giant you are facing. There is a sound, and I believe that sound can break down the walls of the enemy. Blind Bartimaeus cried out to the voices of hurt, rejection, and distraction that around him that tried to silence him. But he said, the word says that he shouted even louder. Sometimes the best time to sing a song of victory is not at the end of the battle, it's right in the middle of it. Sometimes the best time to worship your way through to the victory that is yours is not at the end when you can see it. It's in faith, right in the middle of it. For I walk through the valley of the shadow of death and I will see no evil. Sometimes in the darkness, God can do more in your faith than he can in the light. Sometimes in the most difficult situations of your life, God can come and develop something so much that you can't ever see in the normality of the mountaintop experience of the highs of life. Sometimes God wants to do something in the darkness of life. And I know that's a message that's sometimes difficult, but what I believe God is more interested in is not our comfort, but our development. He's interested more in our character than our giftings. He's interested more in who we are as people than what we give to this world. It's far more important to be loved by God than to be used by him. Can I say that? Yeah. Intimacy always trumps influence. Yet we live in a world of communication that only glorifies the influence. Why don't we be a church that glorifies the intimacy? It glorifies the secret place. It glorifies the people in this room that have had hard weeks, but they still pray and they still worship because they realize their sound makes a difference. Your sound is important. Things try to block our sound all the time, just like we see in this story. I've realized that even if your sound right now is currently weak, it's better than no sound. I know there are people in this church over the last month have had some really, really difficult, challenging times. And I've seen that a weak sound is better than no sound. One of my favorite quotes goes like this. It says, a small faith is still a faith, just like a small flame is still a fire. There is hope in the weak faith. And sometimes the greatest faith-filled men and women of God have scattered weaknesses across their journey. I can remember a moment in my life There was a, a weak moment of faith of mine, and I believe I've certainly shared it before. I'm unsure if I've shared it in this church before. I became a Christian at 15, 16 years old, a crossover between year 10 and 11. And um, I was born in church, raised in church. Literally, when I was in my mother's womb, I was coming and dump, jumping up and down, singing songs to Jesus. Like, it's all I can remember. Church is second nature to me. I was raised to it. But one of the things I realized when I became a Christian at 16 years old is there's a difference between raised in church and raised in Christ. That it's easy to come and sing songs, but there's a difference when you've got a relationship with the God you're singing to. And um, I, I went to church and I'd sing songs. I put my hands up. I knew the routine. I knew what to do to look like a good Christian. But behind the scenes and outside of the church building, I was a completely different, disrupted person. It climaxed in year 10 when I was kicked out of all my lessons in year 10. I was put in a contract in this thing called isolation, which is literally just like a room full of cubicles and five lessons a day, I would wait, I'd go there at 9 a.m., I'd start, I'd walk into this school building, I'd go to isolation, and I would go sit in one of these cubicles and literally five lessons a day, I would be given a different textbook to the lesson I was meant to be in in that section. Here's maths, all your classmates are doing maths right now, so there's the textbook. You're on page 400, just read it. And it was my own fault because I was extremely misbehaved. I was a lost cause. I had no respect for anyone around my life. I didn't know God. I didn't know Jesus. All I knew was the church. And then, long story short, my parents moved away from the school that I was in. And I stayed living there with my grandma for a year. And I finished my GCSEs in this school. But every weekend, I would go back home to where my parents were. And there was one moment where my parents went to this new church that they 
were involved in. And I walked into this building. I've been to church my whole life. And there was one moment where the Spirit of God turned up. And Jesus literally showed himself to me for the first time. And everything transformed in that moment. It doesn't mean that I became perfect. It just, became, just meant that I realized who my Savior was. Can anyone remember that moment in your life? Where God came and transformed things for you. That you realize that the cross says it, it, it's finished. That there's a newness and a hope and a purpose for your life that you cannot find anywhere else. And I can remember finding that moment and becoming a Christian. And then I'd have to go back to my school with all my friends who were doing drugs, alcohol, parties all the time. And suddenly I realized, here's, here's when we find out what it means to live a life of everyday faith, right? When we leave this building. And we're not surrounded by the worship and the preachers and the motivation and the hunger. When we're going back into our normalities of life, there is what it looks like to have everyday faith. And I did two years of it. I finished my GCSEs. Thankfully, I passed them all. And I went to college up north. And I can remember only, I was just about to turn 18. And I got a phone call from a friend when I was in the middle of a church service just like this. I was sat right in the middle. My pastor was up just about to preach. It was at the end of worship. My phone started vibrating in my pocket. So I went into my phone. I pulled it out. And there on the phone was one of my best friends from school who I'd just left. So I thought, I'd best take this. I've not spoke to him for a good month or so because I've not been around. I've moved away. So I walked out and I walked into the car park. And I can remember walking into this car park and answering this phone, unlocking my phone and saying, hey, mate, how are you doing? Is everything okay? What's going on? And you know when you get those moments where you hear the sound of someone's voice and you know it's not right? Some of you will remember that. When you get a phone call, you speak to someone and you can immediately tell by the sound of their voice something's not right here. And he said, hey, mate, are you, sorry to ring you right now. Are you by yourself, like, where are you at? And I said, yeah, I'm just in the car park at the moment by myself. No one's around. Is everything okay? And he said, no, it's actually not. So I stopped and I paused a little bit. And I said, okay, mate, well, what's, what's going on here? What's happened? I'm going to use a different name. But he said, remember Bob? Bob being my best friend who, I had three best friends in school from year 7 to 11. He was one of those guys. Of course I remember Bob. Spoke to him a few months ago. Well, he's dead. And there I was as an 18-year-old boy. Christian for two years. Trying to figure out what it means to live a life of everyday faith. And suddenly in the car park of a church when no one's around. Bombshell explodes. My faith is rocked, and doubts start to arise in my heart. Of God, where are you even in this situation? When it all hits the fan, where are you now? When I'm by myself in the car park nearly crying because my best friends died, where are you at now? I said, I'll be there a few days later brothers and friends of ours are carrying this coffin down the funeral. Thousands turn up because a young boy's lost his life due to a terrible illness called cancer. And I can remember having questions and conversations with people because they knew I was the Christian. And suddenly when you find yourself in a situation like that, everyday faith starts to change a little bit, right? Faith starts to be rocked a little bit. Folks starts to start swaying a little bit. And I can remember coming back and going back into my dad's office angry. And I opened the door. I said, where's God now then? I've been a Christian for two years. I've had these encounters. I, I felt this presence, yeah. But where's he at now? How do I respond to these people? My dad looked back at me and he said, Sean, it's going to be okay. God is still good. And I can remember going back into church. A few weeks later, I was asked to preach at this church, and I was only young, it's actually one of my first times I ever preached, and I can't remember if it was on this scripture or what scripture it was, but I can remember the moment of being stood there in the front row of this church, and it was my home church, they all knew me, just about to go off to Bible college, I was the young gun, excited to preach, asked for the opportunity, wonderful, and there I was in the front row, a few days, a few weeks, I think it was like a week and a half after this funeral, and I was stood right on the front row, and during worship, I was crying, and I was asking God, God, how am I going to preach your word? How am I going to have faith in you when I've got doubts? My faith feels weak right now. My fire feels small. I don't feel like I've got a lot for you right now. What am I going to do? 
And I stood down on the front row and I worshipped. And in the quiet place, I sung my songs to Jesus. I put my hands up and I said, God, I don't know what's going on right now, but I believe there's a purpose. I believe there's a plan. And down here in the quiet place, it was tough and hard. And the voices I was hearing were voices of rejection, voices that were trying to stop me from God's purpose and God's will. Get up to preach. God is still good. And God is still faithful. And God still overcomes my problems. And God still beats the battles. And the same faithful God that was faithful back then is the same God that will be faithful now and faithful in the future. Because I am part of the kingdom of God. I am a child of God and a son of God. And he is far superior to the difficulties that come in this life. Everyday faith started to change from that moment. I started to realize that God develops me more sometimes when I'm weak and difficult than when things are going right. And I started to preach to myself, faith comes from hearing. Sometimes you've got to speak this word over your situations and lives. Sometimes you've got to be by yourself in your bedroom. You've got to open up the word and don't just read it. Speak it out in faith over your situation. Speak it out in faith over your life. For there is more. There is more to what God has got for us as a church and got for you as a person. There is more. God is always the God of more. He has more for us. But it takes faith to see what he has got for us. But when we didn't know what the cross was about, think back to the moment where we didn't understand the gospel, we didn't understand Jesus, we didn't understand faith. Before that moment, everything was in chaos. Our purpose was unsatisfying. Our future was unsure. Our, our identity was being rocked over every situation. But when Jesus was raised high on that cross and he screamed out to the world and he screamed out to your life, it is finished. Everything changed in our lives. Everything changed because the gospel is powerful. It changes things in our lives. It changes things in our situations. And here's what's happened. When he was raised up and he declared over your life, it is finished. It means the enemy can come for you, but he cannot have you. It means the enemy can attack you, but he cannot kill you. It means that no matter what the voices are around your life, the past, present, and future, there is a greater voice in your life, and that voice is of Jesus where it says, it is finished in your life. The enemy wants to define you by your scars, but Jesus wants to define you by his scars. There is a victory we can now live out of that changes everything. So when we hear the voices of rejection and we hear the voices of the past, there must be a sound that comes out from our life that changes the environment around us. I'd love David to come up, if that's okay. Josh, Solomon, can you come join me on stage as well? I didn't prep you for this, but can you come forward? Josh is one of my... Um, youth leaders and also a very, very good friend of mine. And just while I have the opportunity, whilst he's on stage, just want to say he's a great man of God. And if there's any young people out there that's looking for a great mentor, this man can be that man for you. One of the things I love about this passage is I wrap up and close. I'm going to be closing in the next five minutes. It's a blind Bartimaeus, as you know, from verse um, 50 onwards. It said that he was wearing a cloak. Verse 49 says, And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, for he is calling you. And verse 50 says these words, And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. People know that the Bible don't put anything in there by accident, right? There's a reason to every word that's in there. God's breathed it and designed it to help us and shape us. Now we look at this and we know that the cloak clearly signifies something in his life. The cloak clearly signifies something in his life, but... One of the things that I've realized in my research in this is that the cloak was actually given to him by someone else. And you might think, how do you know this? This happened 2,000 years ago. It's a small little story. I'll tell you how. Google. There you go. <laughs> and um, what happened is back in the day then, they had a, a specific kind of outcome to show people those who uh, were any form of disability or could not find a good job, could not find a good income, what they could do is they could go to the government and they could ask the government, hey, I literally can't get a job. I'm going to these interviews and I'm blind. And there's not the same kind of measurements we have in today's society to help these people. They were just kind of castrated and left to the side back then. 
So what the government would do is they came up with this great proposal. And this proposal simply went like this. If you have a disability, if you cannot find work, then we want to hear from you. Come to us and you can apply for a cloak. The cloak wasn't Gucci or Louis Vuitton. Just a normal cloak. But it was a specific cloak. And what the cloak did is it signified to the people walking past that this person has a right to beg. He has a right to be able to reach out for money, for food, for help, for support. So blind Bartimaeus, hearing about this, he is blind, he's homeless, he's poor, he makes his way to the government and he speaks to the government, he says, hey, I can't see, I can't get a job, I'm really struggling, can't provide for anyone, can you help me out? The government say, yeah, here, here's a cloak that I'm going to put on you and this is going to be your identity, this is what it's going to define you now. When people see you, they will know that they can give to you, they can help you with food, that they can do these things, and this cloak is going to become who you are. So for many years, blind Bartimaeus, he lived out of this cloak. This cloak was his provider. This cloak was his supporter, his sustainer. This cloak was the thing that brought him in and cut income to his life. This was the cloak that fed him. This was the cloak that did all these wonderful things into his life from what he knew. And Jesus turns up. Verse 50. Blind Bartimaeus heard a sound. He responded with a sound of worship. It made Jesus stop dead in his tracks and respond. And it says that he flung his cloak on the floor. And he sprang up and he ran to Jesus. We know the end of a story. A miracle happened. An encounter happened. A relationship happened. Intimacy happened. Everything changed because he heard a sound. He responded with worship. And then he moved. And in moving towards Jesus, his identity completely changed. Could it be that we have churches full of people that are still wearing their old clothes? Could it be that we have churches that come and sing songs every single week, but they have yet to grasp the truth that their identity has been completely transformed by the power of Christ? Could it be that people's sounds are being blocked because the cloaks that they're wearing are not the robes of righteousness that Jesus gives us? There are grave clothes. Joshua, you just turn around a moment. There are many cloaks that I see people wearing. Many cloaks I specifically see young people wearing. I love working with young people and I believe that God's got some great plans, but we're also in a real desolate time right now. We're in a reformation of how we should do youth work and how we reach young people. But what I see is the same truths that happened back then and the same truths that happen right now. Young people are walking around. I don't think it's just young people. I think the church is walking around and they're wearing the cloaks of old that come from people that are not of God's purpose and plan. People have said things over your life and they are not what God says over your life. People have put things on you that you should not be wearing. Could it be the cloak of rejection? Once I was rejected back in my past, I can remember the moment where I felt rejected. I didn't get the opportunity. Rejection sticks to us and clings to us like a cloak. And Jesus comes around and on a Sunday morning we try to worship, we try to make a sound because we know we should be, but what's stopping us is the voice of rejection has turned into a cloak over our lives. What about unworthiness? Anyone ever felt unworthy before in this place? Unworthiness stops us from entering into his courts because God declares over your life that you are worthy. You're now seen through the image of Jesus Christ in your life. Unworthiness can't stop you from his presence. And love. In a world that portrays a love that is fake and false and ends in ruin, it's so easy to feel unloved in this world. The book of Romans tells us that when we understand who Christ is and we get up and we throw off our cloak and we run towards him, it says there's nothing that can separate from his love. No demon, no hell, no trial, no tribulation, no hardship, no high, no low stop us from his love could it be feeling worthless feeling like we haven't got worthy to enter into the gates of the king of kings to sit by his feet and to worship him 
and to bring what we have, the small things we have to his feet and say, Jesus, they're yours. We feel unworthy because we haven't got the gifts that other people have got. We don't feel like we've got the worth that other people have got. We live in a world of Instagram that's always promoting someone else's life, which is perfect and beautiful by the scenes of it. And what does it do? It makes us feel worthless. And it's a cloak that stops us from getting into the presence of God. Finally, unfavorable. We see the favor of God on other people's situations and lives. And it automatically turns into a stumbling block for us really stepping into the plans of God. God says you're favorable this morning, church. He says the favor is upon you. God's favor is upon you. God's favor is upon you. And suddenly they all start to fall to the ground. Just like they did with blind Bartimaeus. And in one moment, just because he was persistent with his sound, he was persistent with the voices that he heard, he says he sprang up. And there in itself, the cloak fell to the ground. And you have in yourself a new creation a creation that declares over their life the old has gone and the new has come, that nothing from the past can now dictate my future, that I don't have to be spectacular in order to be significant because the gospel is far greater. The new identity of this church is a church that's favored, is a church that's loved, is a church that's clean, and it's a church that's cherished not because you're good, but because Jesus is good, not because you won the battle, but because Jesus won the battle. And when he declared it on the cross once again, he said it is finished. It means your shame is gone. Your past is gone. The sins you cannot remember, you've sin, sins you cannot forget, God cannot remember anymore. It says they were washed away in the sea of forgetfulness. Because it's a new creation. What would it look like if we took off our graves of clothes and we started to believe in the truth of his word? That where you set your foot tomorrow morning, there's power, there's favor his presence goes before you. That's what it looks like to have an everyday faith. Faith in the things unseen. Faith in the things that are finished. Faith in the things that are settled. New life, new purpose, new hope. Thank you, Josh. Would you stand with me, church, as we end? and Emily have been praying for this sermon over the past few weeks and one of the things I was praying for mostly is that there were people that would join us this morning that of course they would be touched by God but my heart is to see new life and new hope, my heart is to see Jesus encounter people for the first time I was praying leading up to this service that there were people that would join us that don't know who Jesus is, they've never met him before, they've never understood him, they've never realised him, they don't have a relationship with him my prayer is that someone would come to know Jesus this morning. In the first service, there was one person that responded to the gospel. Heaven is celebrating because of that one person. And if there's more here in this second service, then God wills that you will respond to his beautiful gospel that will change your life. Before we get to that, I was just wondering whether I could just pray for us as a family that this week ahead... Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever your week looks like, that we would just pray that God would come and sustain us, that he would help us to have everyday faith, that we would believe in the best, we would see God come through in our workplaces, even if it's desolate, even if it's dark, even if it's confused and even if it's distracted, that God would break through. So if you're comfortable with this, will you just lift up your hands to heaven? I would just love to pray with us all. Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you would just support us and sustain us, that as we move forward and we push into the week ahead, there are new adventures, new missions, new dreams, new callings on our lives that you have planned for us. And this isn't naming and claiming, this is just listen and obey. So we ask Holy Spirit that you will come and we will have the ears to hear what you are saying to your church. We will have the ears to hear the missions you have for us this week. That we will raise the level of expectancy and faith in our everyday life. That this week we can see people come to know Jesus in our workplace. That this week we can see sickness is healed in our workplace. That this week we can see the gospel go forth in our workplace and our families. That we can see great things happen that point to you rather than point to us. So I ask Holy Spirit, will you help us? Shed your light upon us. Remove the veils and the cloaks off our lives. 
And may we move forth with confidence and faith that your plans and purposes are still strong and mighty, like a high tower in this region, in this city, in our lives. We surrender everything to you now, God, and we ask you to come and help us, speak to us and shape us. And will you just keep your eyes closed if you're comfortable with that? The main thing I love about this story is not just the healing, not just the miracle, not just that blind Bartimaeus shows an incredible life, he shows what it means to be everyday faith. The main thing I love about this story is that blind Bartimaeus was the homeless, poor beggar sat on the side of the road at the beginning of the story. But by the end of the story, he was at the heart of the scene, right in the middle, close to Jesus, transformed and changed. And I believe this morning God can come and do the same thing in someone's life. You may be at the side. You may have come in here this morning not asking any questions, not knowing what God's about, not even really having a care in the world about God. You may have come in here with loads of questions about him. Wherever you find yourself in the story, Jesus comes to you now and he asks you that question and he asks blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? If you're in a situation where you feel like you need to respond some way to God that you need to rather walk into a relationship with him for the first time and say do you know what I want to give this a go I want to give this church stuff a go this Christian stuff a go this Jesus stuff a go if that's you and you want to you want to just make a commitment to me and to God then I'm going to give it a go I'm going to see if it's real I'm going to try ask questions I'm going to follow I'm going to surround myself with good people then I'm going to ask you to do something in a minute which is going to be brave I'm going to ask you to put your hand up really high in the sky so I can see it. And I'm just going to acknowledge it and you can put it back down and that's going to be the end of it. And then I want to pray a prayer for you. I want to pray a prayer that God's love will come and show himself to you. That he will show himself to be real in your life. For those that are watching online, you can click a banner at this moment as well. So if there's anyone in the room that wants to make that commitment, that rather wants to come back to Jesus or make a commitment for the first time to follow Jesus for the first time, will you just lift up your hand really high so I can see it? Thank you. Someone's going to come and prop a little envelope in your hand. It's going to help you on the journey. If there's anyone else, before I pray for this person. Thank you. Just a few more moments. Is there anyone else? Father God, we thank you for these two people that responded to your word. We thank you, Jesus, that you have come into this place and you have spoken into people's lives. We thank you, God, that you are the higher authority, that your word goes where no man can go. And I ask, Holy Spirit, for these people now. I ask, Lord, that your love will come like a rushing wind into their lives, that they will experience you afresh that they'll know that you're real, they'll know that your power is real. In the following days ahead, I pray, Lord, that you put good people around their lives so what they hear is good and faithful. I pray, Lord, that their sound doesn't diminish with the problems, but their sound goes forth because you're sustaining them and you're empowering them. Holy Spirit, I pray, Lord, that you make them a new creation, that the things of the past fall and they go dim in their lives, but the things of the new the identity of Christ that comes strong in their life, that they see you for the first time and they see you working in their lives. Thank you that you love them. Thank you that you care for them. For anyone that's responded online, I pray for all those online right now. God, will your presence move in there, wherever they're watching it from, through a phone, a tablet, a laptop, a computer. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you'll come and move into their lives as well. May they see you afresh in a new and purpose-filled way. In your wonderful name we pray. We give you thanks and we give you glory. We say together, amen.